So let's turn that on. All right. Good morning, everybody. So today we'll probably finish off most of chapter 19. Um, and then whatever we don't do, we'll finish up tomorrow. But uh, just start off a couple of reminders. Uh, so first off, actually one reminder. So don't forget exam three is on Wednesday. So this Wednesday, so two days from today. And uh, the announcement is this morning I posted the uh, exam example solutions. So those are now available on Blackboard. So, so if you've worked on any of those, so now you can start looking at uh, the solutions for those and see how you're doing with all that. Uh, so yeah, so I think that's about it for announcements. Uh, so, <laughs> pardon me. So we have seen uh, so far how to combine resistors and capacitors in parallel and series. But one important thing to point out about all those examples is they've always had one battery. So now the question becomes, so what happens if I start introducing more batteries into the system? How do we now combine these things? And can we still use parallel and series, what we've learned so far, and just kind of remind us this is how we combine them in parallel and series. So again, resistors, when they are in series, we simply add them together, while capacitors, we have to inversely add them. And then for resistors in parallel, we inversely add them, and for capacitors, we simply add them together. So for example, let's take a look at this diagram here. I just recently learned there is a laser pointer. So here's my laser pointer. So, so let's say I have this circuit here. So notice that now I have two batteries. So I have one battery here and I have one battery here. And then I just have a bunch of resistors. So the question is, can we still combine all these things together using these rules? So for the series and parallel for the resistors. And the answer is it's, it's not exactly clear cut anymore. And the reason for that is, as we said before, what's in parallel is in, has the same potential. So what this means is that this leg of the branch here is all in parallel with everything else. We know that whatever this thing has across here, this has the same potential, but that's the same potential with everything along this line here. So this battery with these two resistors has to have exactly the same amount of potential drop across this here, or whatever the potential is, with this portion of the leg. And then whatever is in this portion of the leg also has to have the same potential as what's across this leg and what's across this leg. So the problem is, once I start adding now more batteries, it's no longer straightforward how I can combine these because I can't really say that these two resistors are in parallel with this resistor anymore because that's not true. What's true is that these two resistors with this battery are in parallel with this resistor, not just these two resistors. But it is true that these two resistors are in series and these two resistors are in series, but but again, I know that's true, but I don't know exactly how I can combine now these with the battery into parallel with this because it's not true anymore that just these two are in parallel with this guy. So we basically have to come up with a new way to now deal with when we have multiple batteries. So if I have one battery, I can still use these rules, but if I have more than one battery, I can't simply use these rules anymore because it's not as clear cut, it's not clearly defined how that actually works. So that brings us into the new way we're going to start looking at how to combine these things together, which is what's known as Kirchhoff's rules. So Kirchhoff's loop rules. So Kirchhoff's loop rules actually has all of this embedded inside of it, but it does it in a different way where we actually don't have to care about what's in parallel and what's in series. It'll automatically do it for us. So even if I had one resist, or sorry, one battery, I could still use Kirchhoff's loop rules and not have to worry about these, and I would still get the same answer at the end of the day, but it would actually end up being a little more complicated, but well, that's okay. So talk about Kirchhoff's loop rules, we first have to come up with some conventions. So let's talk about some sign conventions that we're gonna need. So first off, let's deal with batteries. So how do we use batteries in Kirchhoff's loop rules? So here, let's say, here is my battery. So here, here's point A, and I'm going across the battery, going from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, and I'm gonna end up at point B. So that means is I'm gonna start here at A, and I'm gonna go across the battery from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. 
So here we get then at the change of potential, which is equal to the potential difference between B and A is then equal to positive the EMF. So here the battery is gonna have some EMF. This then gives us a positive. So if I go across the battery from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, that's then gonna be a positive. However, if I go the opposite direction, so let me rotate the direction of the battery. So now let me put the positive terminal first, followed by the negative terminal. So in this case, I'm still gonna go in the same direction. I'm gonna go from point A to point B. So my change of potential from B to A is actually now gonna be negative the EMF of the battery. So in this case, if I go across the battery from the positive terminal to the negative terminal, I'm now going to drop potential because all this is saying is that the potential at point A is greater than potential at point B, which is why I get negative of the EMF. Right. Now, let's talk about resistors. <clears throat> I have a question. Sure. <laughs> okay, this is probably a dumb question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. So you said, V, B, A, but then we're going from A to B, so. Right, well, remember that delta is always final minus the initial. So oh, delta okay. is always gonna be the final, which in this case is B minus the initial, which is A, which I'm writing gotcha. as B, B, A. Right. Okay, that makes sense, okay. So that's right, so this is the final location, this is the initial, so I'm still going from A to B, so I'm going in this direction. Exactly, okay. <clears throat> Uh, that was a very good clarifying question. So let's say here's my resistor. So this has a resistance of R, and let's call this point A again, and let's call this point B. So in the first case, we're gonna go, we're gonna say that the current here is going in this direction. So the current is gonna go from A to B. And then we are gonna go in the same direction as the current. So I'm gonna go from A to B. So here, my change of potential, which is gonna be potential from A to B, so BA, is then equal to minus the current times the resistance. Because remember, we said that the point of having the resistor is to have a potential drop. So here, we're then losing potential. But notice if I go the opposite direction, so what color haven't I used? Yellow. So in this case, I go in this direction. If I go in the opposite direction as the current, then my potential difference now going from B to A, so I'm gonna write this as BAB, is now equal to positive I times R. Right? So if I go across the resistor in the opposite direction as the current, I now have the gain potential because, again, my potential here would be lower than the potential here, so if I go in the opposite direction, then I have gain potential, but if I go in the same direction, I have lost potential. Right? And finally, let's talk about capacitors. So for capacitor, let's say here, much like the battery, let's say I'm going from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. So this is A to B. In this case, if I go from the positive terminal to the negative terminal, so again, I'm going in this direction, then my change of potential going from A to B, so that's V, B A is gonna be negative Q divided by C. Okay. So in this case, again, I have a potential drop. So the potential at A is greater than the potential at B, so I have lost potential. However, if we go in the opposite direction, so if I go in the direction of yellow here and I go from B to A, in this case, my change of potential, which is gonna be V A B, is then gonna be equal to positive Q divided by C. Okay. So basically these are going to be the sign conventions that we're gonna use with Kirchhoff's loop rules. So Kirchhoff's loop rules are nothing more than what we have seen so far, which is just conservation of energy and conservation of charge. So let's write down formally what these laws are gonna be, and then we have to use these as the sign conventions to make sense out of all of these rules. So Kirchhoff's loop rules boils down to two rules. So here are the two rules. So the first rule is what's known as the junction rule, which is basically just conservation of charge. So much like we've talked about before, what happens is what, anytime I go to a node, let's say I have something like this, 
and I have currents coming in, and then I have currents going out. So let's say current going in is simply equal to I1. <clears throat> current going out is going to be I1 and I2. What the junction rule says is that I have to abide by whatever comes in has to go out. So all this means then is that the sum of the currents going in must be equal to the sum of the currents going out. So this is what we call the junction rule. <laughs> so in this case, my junction rule simply reads that I1 is equal to I2 plus I3. So this is my junction rule. So again, just means conservation of charge, whatever comes in has to come out. So in here, whatever came in is I1, what's leaving is then I2 and I3. Okay, so this is what we call the junction rule. Rule number two is what's known as the loop rule, which is also just simply conservation of energy. So what this one says is if I go around a loop, let's say I start off at point A here, and I go around some closed loop of my circuit, and I come back to A, all this says is if I change a potential around that loop, which is starting at A and finishing at A, must be equal to zero. So I haven't gained energy and I haven't lost energy. Whatever energy I start off with at A has to be exactly the same by the time I get to A. So this is what's called the loop rule, which is just conservation of energy. Now, <clears throat> things about the loop rule and junction rule. So it turns out that not all junctions are independent and not all loops are independent as well. So here, so not all junctions are independent. And we'll bring up an example and I'll, I'll describe more what that means, but not all junctions are independent. And not all loops are independent. What I mean by that is that they give us redundant information. Are independent. So basically, easiest way to kind of describe what's going on here is to look at an example. So let's look at that example that I drew originally, and let's kind of redraw it and we'll talk about how this thing works. So here, again, I have battery E1 attached to a resistor R, attached to another resistor R4, which is then attached to a battery pointing in this direction. So this is then E2 attached to resistor R2, attached to resistor R1. So this is one loop. And then up here, I have another resistor R3, okay? So here, so what do I mean about all this stuff not being independent? So here, what I have is what? One junction here, and let's call that junction A, and I have another junction here, to call that junction B. So what I have though are three independent legs of my circuit. I have this top leg, which means all the current flowing through this top leg has to be exactly the same because everything up here is connected in series. Let me use my highlighter again, or my laser pointer. So again, everything up and through here is connected in series, so everything here has to have exactly the same current. Everything through the center leg here is also connected in series, so everything in this section also has to have the same current. And then everything down here is connected in series, so this all has to have the same current as well. So that means in this picture here, I have three legs, which means I have three currents. Okay. Now this one here is saying that's what? At this junction, I have to have current coming in and current leaving. But at this junction here, I have to have the same currents leaving, which are going in on the other one, and then going out, which is the same as the other one. Okay? Which basically means that here, even though I have two junction points, these two junction points give me the same information. They're just opposite from each other. Right? Whatever was coming in here is leaving here, and whatever is leaving here is coming in here. So these two junctions, even though I have two junctions, they're not independent from each other. They give me redundant information. So typically the way it works is that's what? There are n minus one independent junctions. Which means here we have what? Two junctions. 
but one is independent. While the other one gives me the same information. So the other one is redundant. <clears throat> okay. Now notice here, I also have three loops. So how do I know I have three loops? Well, I have one loop, which is the big outside loop. So this is all one loop here. So I have a big outside loop. I also have this small top loop across here. So that's my second loop. And then I have the small bottom loop here, which is my third loop. So technically here I have three different loops. I have the big outside loop, I have the top small loop, and I have the bottom small loop. So here I actually have three loops. I'm gonna use yellow in this case. So here we have three loops. However, again, not all of these loops are independent. So notice that if I took, whoops, my learned there is, if I took this loop here, and I took this loop here, then the big outside loop is simply a combination of the top loop with the bottom loop. So that means is that what? Even though I have three loops, only two of these are independent. Whichever two I choose doesn't matter, but only two of them are independent. So again, the top loop here is simply a combination of the bottom loop with the top loop, or I can take the entire loop and just the bottom loop here, or I can take the entire loop and just this top loop here, it doesn't matter. But what matters is that not all of the loops are independent. So even though I have three loops, again, only two of these are independent. So only two independent loops. So again, in general, what's true is that there are n minus one independent loops. Again, the other is a combination of all the other loops. <laughs> so basically, the way that Kirchhoff's loop rules works is, first of all, we have to choose which junction we're going to look at. So again, if I have something that looks like this, I have two independent junctions, I'm simply going to choose one of those junctions. Doesn't matter which one. All that matters is I choose one of them. Here, since I have three loops, I know only two of them are independent. So again, I'm gonna choose which two loops that I'm gonna look at. Again, doesn't matter which ones I choose. I just have to choose them and then be consistent with those. The next thing is, since all of our loop rules here, so let's go back to our rules, all depend on the direction at which we travel relative to the direction of the current. What we then have to decide is what direction is the current going through each one of these loops, i.e. in each one of these legs, and then how we're going to proceed across each one of these different loops. Okay. So what do I mean by that? So what I mean is whenever I have a circuit like this, I'm never going to tell you the direction of the currents. You have to assume a direction of the currents. Is there a correct direction of the currents? Well, yes and no <laughs> is the over answer to that. Yes, the current will be flowing in a particular direction, but can I choose the wrong direction? The answer is absolutely yes. So this would be the same thing as if I had what, like an inclined plane, going back to 175. Let's say I had an inclined plane, I put a block on here, I attach over a rope to a pulley with another block on here, and then you have to assume the direction of the acceleration. So you could assume that this is going to accelerate in this direction, or you can assume this is going to accelerate in this direction. What's the difference? Well, the difference is when you do the math, one of them is going to be positive and the other one's going to be negative, but the magnitude is going to be the same, as long as there's no friction. So if you turn out this one ended up being negative, it just means it's accelerating up the plane, so what? So you chose the wrong direction, but who cares? The magnitude is still the same, so it doesn't change anything. Here, it's gonna be the same thing. So I have to assume a direction of the currents, and as long as the currents satisfy the junction rule, then whatever it is that I choose is fine. I'm, the only thing that's gonna happen at the end of the day is I'm gonna get an overall negative sign, which just told me I chose the wrong direction, but the magnitude is gonna be the same. Okay. So, first of all, we then have to choose the direction of the current. Now, the way I usually do this is I look at the batteries. So what I know is that current goes from the positive terminal back to the negative terminal. So I would say, okay, whatever current is running here is gonna be running in this direction. 
going to be going out of the battery in this direction. Second of all, whatever current is coming out of this one is going to be moving in this direction because again, the battery is going to force from the positive terminal. So I'm going to say the current's going to move in this direction. Now for this top leg, since there is no current, or sorry, since there is no battery, I have no natural way of actually saying what direction the current is going to go. But the only thing that has to be true is that I have to satisfy the junction rule. But notice here, this current is going into the junction, this current is going out of the junction. So again, up here, it doesn't matter what direction I choose. If both of them are coming into the junction, then I would have to have this one going out of the junction. But here, since I have one coming in and one going out, it doesn't matter which direction I choose, I just have to choose it. Okay. So let me arbitrarily say, okay, my current's gonna go in this direction, just for funsies. <clears throat> So let's call this one down here current I1, let's call this current here I2, and let's call this current here I3. So now I have labeled all of my different currents. Okay. So from here, now we have to decide, okay, which one of our two junctions are we gonna use? Are we gonna use A or are we gonna use B? Okay. It doesn't matter which one I choose, it just matters that I actually choose one. So uh, Adrian, what's your favorite letter, A or B? A. A, great, so let's use this one. Okay, now we have to decide, okay, which one of our loops are we gonna use? Are we gonna use the top one? Are we gonna use the bottom one? Or are we gonna use the top one and the big one? Or are we gonna use the bottom one and the big one? Again, doesn't matter what we choose, we just have to be consistent with what it is that we choose. Uh, Katie, I see you next, so I'm gonna pick on you. So which, which two do you wanna use? You wanna use the top one and the bottom one? or the big one in the top one, or the big one in the bottom one? Um, let's use the big one and the bottom one. Just the big one and the bottom one, okay. So I'm gonna call this one loop one, and the bottom one loop two. Good. So, so the last thing we now have to decide, now that we have chosen all of those things, is which direction are we gonna go around the loop? Now, what's important for that, again, is this is where the, the rules that we wrote down come in. So one thing I could do is for this bottom loop, for example, so you notice that the current in the bottom loop is naturally going in the counterclockwise direction. So what I can decide is I wanna go around this loop also in the counterclockwise direction. So this is the way I'm gonna proceed around my loop. Okay. For the top one, or for the whole entire thing, here I have current going in one direction, here I have current going in the opposite direction, so it doesn't naturally flow beautifully in a circle. So it doesn't really matter which way I choose, but I have to, again, choose a direction to be consistent. So, Jolie, I see you're next. So what direction do you want to go around the big loop? Do you want to go in a clockwise direction or in a counterclockwise direction? Uh, I guess clockwise. Clockwise, change it up, good. So let's go in this direction. So we're gonna go around the big loop in this direction, okay? Good. So how does Kirchhoff's loop rules work? Well, what Kirchhoff's loop rules work is we're going to write Kirchhoff's loop rules using those conventions. Let me erase this stuff, give me some room here. By going around each one of these different loops and using the junction rule. So the first thing we're gonna do is use the junction rule on this junction A here. So here we're gonna start off with a junction rule. So we're gonna say junction A. So junction A, I have what? I2 coming in and I3 and I1 leaving. So according to our junction rule, we're gonna say the sum of the currents going in, which is simply I2, is then equal to what's leaving, which is gonna be I3 plus I1. So this is my junction rule. So whatever's coming in, this is current in, is then equal to current out. So whatever junction we're looking at, which Adrian told us to look at A, we're simply going to look at A, and then write down what's coming in is equal to what's coming out. So this is step one. Well, we're, we'll write down steps in a second, great. So now, once I've done that, we're now going to use our loop rules. So now I'm gonna look at loop one. So loop one is now we're gonna go around this outside loop. So usually what I do is I'm gonna start off at a junction. So in this case, I'm gonna start off at that same junction A. And then I'm gonna go around my loop in the direction that Jolie decided, which is the clockwise direction, and we're gonna write down everything we find until we get back to A, okay. using all of these beautiful sign conventions that we wrote down here. Okay. 
So what does that mean? So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start off at A, and I'm going to go around my loop going in this direction. So first I'm going to go around this way. I don't find anything until I run into resistor R3. So resistor R3, I'm going to go across the resistor in the same exact direction as the current. So that means I'm going to go back to my sign conventions here. And what I'm going to notice is, what according to the green one, if I go in the same direction, I'm sorry, the red one, I go across the resistor in the same direction as the current, that corresponds to a potential drop, which is given by the current times the resistance. So we're going to go back to here. So here I'm going across the resistor in the same direction as the current. So according to my sign convention, that becomes negative the current, which is I3 times the resistance R3. Okay. So I'm going to write that down. Now I'm going to continue. Now I'm at junction B. I keep going. The next thing I run into is R4, which has current R I1 going through it. But notice in this case, I'm going opposite the direction of the current. Current in this case is going upward. I'm going downward. So according to my sign conventions, let's go back here, that corresponds to the yellow one. So now I'm going opposite the direction of the current. That corresponds to a potential gain of the current times the resistor. So let's write that down. So now I'm going opposite the direction of the current. So I'm going to write plus I1 R4. Now I keep going. Next thing I run into is little r. In this case, again, I'm going in the opposite direction as the current. So here I get another plus I1 times R. Now I keep going. In this case, I'm going to go across the battery, but I'm now going from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. So I'll go back to my sign conventions. According to that, if I go from the positive terminal to the negative terminal, that corresponds to a potential drop, which is given by the amount of the EMF, which in this case is E1. So now I get a negative E1. I keep going. There's nothing until I get back to the junction. Now that I'm back to the junction, I simply put equals zero. I've now finished that loop. Sounds okay. From there, I'm now going to go through loop two. Loop two, again, I'm going to start off at junction A, but this time I'm going in a counterclockwise direction. So from junction A, I'm going to go down. Here, first thing I run into is the battery, but I'm going to go across the battery from the negative to the positive terminal. So if I go back to my sign conventions, if I go from the negative to the positive terminal, that corresponds to a positive gain in potential, that of the battery. So the first thing we're going to write down is plus E1. Next thing I run into is little r. Little r, this time I'm going across the resistor in the same direction as the currents. That corresponds to a potential drop. So I get a minus I1 little r. Next thing I run into is R4. I'm going in the same direction as the current. So I get a minus I1 R4. Now I'm going to go through the center leg. So now I'm at junction B. I'm going to go through the center. Next thing I run into is the battery. I'm going from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. I go from the negative to the positive, that is a potential increase of E2. Next thing I run into is R2. R2 then, I'm going in the same direction as the current I2, so I get a minus I2 R2. Finally, the last thing I run into is R1. R1, I'm going in the same direction as the current, so I get a minus I2 R1. I'm back to the junction, so I'm gonna simply write equals zero. Okay. Is okay. These are Kirchhoff's loopholes. Okay. Notice that here, what I'm usually going to give you are all the resistors and all the batteries, and I'm simply going to ask you questions like, what's the current in the system? So what that does is since I have three different currents, I have three different unknowns, and notice that now I have three equations with three unknowns. So from here, I would have to then solve for each one of these unknowns, which would be I1, I2, and I3, using these three equations. Right? Remember, mathematically, if I have three unknowns, I need three equations to be able to do so. So this is how Kirchhoff's loop rules work. So again, let's kind of write out some steps. <clears throat> so steps. So step number one. Uh, identify the number of currents. 
So that's going to be, again, how many legs of my circuit do I have? Do I have two legs, three legs, four legs, five legs, etc.? cetera? Okay. Step number two, uh, draw each current. choosing a direction for each current. Step number three, choose an independent <clears throat> junction. Step number four, <clears throat> Uh, choose independent loops. Now, typically, we're only going to look at things like we just did, which have circuits that look like this. So we're going to have basically two loops. So again, you're just going to have to choose which two loops that you're going to go in. And step number five is going to be choose direction. to go around each loop. Step number six, apply junction rule. Apply number seven, gonna be apply loop rule. Finally, number eight, is going to be solve. So basically, the last thing you'll have to do is then just solve a system of what we're going to be looking at mostly our system of three equations with three unknowns. Now, however you want to solve that, there are many, many, many different ways to solve systems of equations. Whatever your favorite way, it doesn't really matter. But these are basically the eight steps that we're going to use. Okay. So let's randomly draw a couple more of these diagrams, uh, kind of get an idea, again, some more practice of how we actually do this, and then we'll actually look at a concrete example. Okay. So let's, let's draw a couple other beautiful things. So let me draw one battery here. Let's put a resistor. Let's put a battery. Uh, those in opposite directions. Let's put a resistor here. Uh, let's put a resistor here for fun. And then let's put a battery here with a resistor. Make it a little bit easier. So let's call this, I don't know, R1, R2, R3, and R4. And let's call this E1. So this is the positive side, positive side. So this is E2 and E3. So this is the positive side. <clears throat> So again, here all we're going to do is go through all these steps and just get a little bit of practice, okay? see how these things work. And then eventually we'll do an actual example and see how all this stuff works. Let's call this junction A and junction B. <clears throat> Good. So <clears throat> again, step number one is identify how many currents that we have. Well, again, number of currents come from how many legs that we have. So again, anything that's connected in series all has to have the same current, which means if I start here at A and I go down across all the way to B, this is one current. If I go through the center, everything across here also has one current. So if I go from A to B in this direction, I also have a current. And if I start off at A, go up and around and back to B, that's all a different current. So here I have three different currents. Same thing as before. So now I just have to choose what direction are my currents going to go and make sure that I satisfy my junction rule. So who do I want to pick on now? Callie, you there? Yes. Good. I don't see your smiling face, so I'm fine. Oh, yep. Sorry about that. There we go. <laughs> So let's say down here, let's call this I1 going through here. So what direction do you want I1 to go? So do you want it to go out of the battery in this direction or do you want it to go through the battery in this direction? Now again, doesn't matter. We just have to put it in there to know what direction to use all those side rules. So which way do you want it to go? Um, let's just do pointing away from the positive. To okay, the so in this direction? Yeah. Good, so let's call that I1. Good. 
Uh, who's up next? Miranda, looks like you're up next. So let's call I2 through the center. Which way do you want I2 to go? Do you want it to go out of the battery in this direction or into the battery in this direction? To the left. This way? Okay. Yeah. Good. So that's going to be I2. Good. And who else is here? Uh, Molly, I'm going to pick on you. Uh, what direction do you want I3 to go? So do you want it to go out of the battery in this direction, to the right, or into the battery going to the left? Uh, to the right. To the right. Okay. So I'll call that I3. Now, again, let's quickly make sure that what we chose satisfies our junction condition, uh, which we can see here it does, because here I have I1 and I2 going into this junction where I3 is leaving. So as long as I have currents going in and currents going out, life is great. I just can't have everything going into the same spot. Because let's think about if I had what, water all pouring into the same location. So if I had a bunch of hoses connected and I have water coming in this direction, water coming in this direction, and everything's compiling at that one point, what's going to happen? It's going to explode. Right? So as long as I satisfy, life is going to be great. So in this case, it does satisfy. Okay. Good. So, uh, who's up next? Emma, you there? Good. So, Emma, which loops do you want to now use? Do you want to use, so in this case, we have, again, three loops. So, we have the whole entire loop, we have the top loop, and we have the bottom loop. So, Emma, which two loops would you like to use? You want to use the top one and the bottom one, or the big one and the top one, or the big one and the, the loop, or the bottom one? Uh, maybe the two little ones. The two little ones? Okay, so we'll call this loop one and this guy loop two. Good. And the last person is Tara. So Tara, which, are you there? Yeah. Good, okay. Which direction do you want to go around loop one? So do you want to go in the direction that the current naturally flows, like in the clockwise direction, or do you want to go in the opposite direction, just for funsies? Let's do clockwise. Clockwise. Sounds good. So now we're going to go around this guy in the clockwise direction. Good. I think I picked on everybody, right? I think so. So unfortunately, Adrian, I'm back to you because I picked on you first. So what direction do you want to go around the second loop? Uh, let's go counterclockwise. Counterclockwise for fun. Okay. Good. So I'm just drawing these arrows with the circles to make sure that when I go around my loops, I know what direction I'm going around. So that way I'm just consistent because we just have to make sure we're going around in the same direction to make sure we're consistent. Now, now as for the second loop, since the two currents are flowing in opposite directions, there's no natural way to go around it. Sometimes that's going to happen. So that's not a big deal. So good. So we've now gone through all of our steps. So now we can start applying now all of our junction rule. So the next step was apply to our junction rule. So let's look at junction A. So according to junction rule A, we simply write the number of currents going in equals the current coming out. In this case, we have current I1 plus I2 coming in, and we have I3 coming out. Nice and easy. Now let's apply our loop rules. So our first loop we're going to look at is 1. So here, we just have to start someplace. Again, I usually like to start at a junction, but it doesn't matter where I start, but I'm going to pick on Katie, and Katie's going to tell me what direction am I going to, where am I going to start? I'm going to start at A or B or someplace else. Let's start at A. Start at A. Okay. So let's start at A. So I'm going to keep picking on you, because I can. So I'm going to start off at A. I'm going to go through the battery, and I'm going to go, because that's the first thing I'm going to run into, I'm going to go from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. So is that a positive increase in potential or a negative decrease in potential, according to our assigned rules? Uh, positive. Good. So first thing I'm going to write down is positive E3. So again, I'm going in the, from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. So that's a positive. So now I'm going to keep going. I'm going to go through to R4. R4, I'm going to go in the same direction at which I, the current is going. Uh, I think Jolie was next, right? So Jolie, is that a negative drop in potential or a positive increase in potential? So I'm going in the same direction as the current across the resistor. It's negative. Negative, good. So I'm going to write a negative I3R4. 
Now I'm going to keep going. I'm going to run into junction B. When I get to junction B, I'm going to go through the center portion. Once I go through the center portion, I'm now going to go across the battery E2 from the negative to the positive. Uh, so I think Miranda was next, right? So Miranda, if I go from the negative to the positive, is that a positive increase of potential for the battery or a decrease? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, who can help her out? Callie, can you help her out? It's a uh, positive. Positive, good. So we go from the negative terminal to the positive terminal across the battery. That is an increase in potential. Good. I'm going to keep going. Next thing I'm going to run into then is the resistor, R3. And you may be going across it in the same direction as the current. So Molly, is that a positive increase in potential or a negative decrease in potential? Is it positive? Almost. So negative. Negative, there we go. So it's a negative, so if I go in the same direction as the current, that is a decrease, so I get a negative I2R3. And now I keep going and I'm back to the junction. So once I get back to that junction, I simply write equals zero. Okay? Good. Very good. So now, Let's start off here. Let's do the second loop. Um, who is up now? So Emma, I believe you're up now. So Emma, do you want to start at A and go in the counterclockwise or start off at B and go counterclockwise? Which way do you want to start? Let's start at B. Start at B, sounds good. So I'm going to start at B. I'm going to keep it going on you. You're not done yet. So I'm going to start out at B. Now I'm going to go counterclockwise, which means I'm going to go in this direction. First thing I run into is the battery. So I'm going from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. So is that a positive or a negative? It's a positive. Positive, good. So I get an E plus E2. Next thing I'm running into is R3. I'm going in the same direction as the current. So Tara, is that a positive or a negative? So if I go across the resistor in the same direction as the current, is that positive or negative? Is it positive? Almost. Negative. <laughs> negative, there we go. <laughs> so minus I2, R3, good. Good, next I run into now is here, R1, but now this time I'm going in the opposite direction as the current. So the current is going up, but we're going down. So Adrian, I think I'm back to you. So if I go in the opposite direction as the current, is that a positive? or negative? Positive. Positive, good. So I get a positive I1, R1. So now I'm gonna go across the battery, but this time I'm going from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. So Katie, is that positive or negative? Uh, that would be a negative. Negative, good, so minus E1. So now I go across the resistor, R2, in the opposite direction at which the current is going. Uh, so Jolie, is that positive or negative? Positive. positive, good. So I get a positive I1, R2. Finally, that brings me back to junction B. So I get equals zero. I have a quick question. Sure, Kelly. How do you know which current to use on that last one? Oh, the last one? Um, Is it so involved in the bottom loop? Right, so in the bottom loop, that's what we called I1 going in this direction. So anything from A here to B along that bottom loop is all I1. Okay. So whatever is connected, so remember what's the same in series is current. So if I start off at B here and I go in this direction, all of this has exactly the same current. Or in this case, we're going from here into this direction, but it doesn't matter as long as these things are in series, they all have to have exactly the same current. Now we arbitrarily call this I1, I could have called it I Cali if I wanted to, it didn't really matter. But I just have to know that since these are all in series, they all have exactly the same current. So anything connected in series like here and here, all of these had their own same currents, but they're different than this current and this current. Okay. Always okay? So that's it. So nice and easy. So again, once you establish all of these rules and you make all of your choices, as long as you go through each one of these, using those choices and using all of these sign conventions, life will be okay.
Okay. Now, again, it doesn't matter what direction we choose the currents to go. It doesn't matter how we call the currents. It doesn't matter which loops that we use. As long as we know what direction and we use the sign conventions properly, we're going to get the correct answer at the end of the day. Okay. So let's actually apply this to now an actual problem. So uh, where's the problem? So let's look at this one. So it says, consider this current, or sorry, this circuit. So this is the original one that we drew down. So this one says that EMF here has 80 volts. EMF2 has 45 volts. Little r has one ohm. R1 here is 40 ohms. Uh, R2 is the same thing as little r, which is one ohm. R3 up here is 30 ohms, and then R4 is 20 ohms. So it wants us to determine then all of the currents within inside of our system. Now I've already randomly drawn the currents on here, so we know which one is which. So let me redraw all this. Okay, so let's redraw our circuit. So again, sorry, get all this stuff right. Okay. So let's redraw. So here's battery E1, which we know is 80 volts connected to little r, where little r is one ohm, connected then to r4, which is then 20 ohms. And through the center, we then have E2. E2 is 45 volts, correctly. Connected then to r2, where r2 is also equal to one ohm, connected to r1, which was what, 40? Uh, yep, yeah, 40 ohms. Good. And then that's all connected to R3. And there's R3. And R3 was what, 30, yeah, 30 ohms. Do you stop doing that? 30 ohms. Good. So again, here all we want to know is what all the different currents. So I've already kind of drawn the currents on here. Um, so let me redraw them. And then you guys can choose everything else. So I have I1 going through the top, I2 from the bottom, and then I3 through the center. So here, I1 this way, I2 this way, and I3 this way. So good. So next part is now we have to choose which loops that we want. So again, we have three loops. We have the big loop, we have the top loop, we have the bottom loop. So which loops do we want to go around? So Molly, I'll let you dictate my legs this time. So which two loops do you want? Uh, two. All right, do you want the top one and yeah. the bottom one? Or the big one and the top one? Or the big one and the bottom one? So which two would you like? Uh, the big and the, uh, the top and bottom. Top and bottom, okay. <laughs> so one and two, sounds good. <laughs> good. Uh, good, Miranda, which way you wanna go around loop one? Do you wanna go in the clockwise direction or counterclockwise direction? Clockwise. Clockwise, good, okay. So this way. And Emma, I see you next. So which way you wanna go around the bottom one? You wanna go counterclockwise or clockwise? Let's go counterclockwise. Counterclockwise, good. All in the same direction, so it's currents, good. Very good, all right. So let's choose our junctions. So we have junction A and junction B. So Adrian, which junction you wanna use, A or B? Let's use B. B, okay, so let's use junction B. So here, use junction B, we now apply the junction rule. So notice here, I have I1 and I2 coming in, and I have I3 leaving. So our junction rule says that we get I1 plus I2 is then equal to I3. Great. Good, so now let's do junction, or loop one. <clears throat> so loop one is gonna be the top one. So Jolie, do you wanna go around starting at A or starting at B? Where do you wanna start? Uh, A. A, okay. So here I'm gonna start at A. I'm gonna go in a clockwise direction, so we're gonna go up. First thing we run into then is R3. So we're going across R3 in exactly the same direction as the currents. So Katie, is that a positive or a negative? 
That would be negative. Negative, good. So I get a minus I1 R3, good. Now I'm gonna to go to junction B, go through the center now. So now I'm gonna go across the negative terminal to the positive terminal. So Cali, is that a positive or a negative? A positive. From the negative to the positive. A positive. Positive, good. So I get a positive E2. Uh, next thing I run into is R2. I'm gonna go across R2 in the same direction as the current. Um, so Miranda, is that positive or negative? Negative. Negative, very good. So I get a minus I3, R2. Uh, last thing I'm gonna go across is R1. I'm gonna go in the same direction as the current. So Tara, is that positive or negative? That'd be negative. Very good, so minus I3, R1. What? Uh, back at the junctions, let's simply equal to current. So now we're gonna do loop two. So loop two, we're now going to go in the counterclockwise direction. Uh, who have I picked on a little bit? Uh, I'll pick on Katie, that sounds good. So Katie, do you wanna start off at A or B? Um, let's start at A. A, okay, so we're gonna go around in the clockwise direction. So first thing I'm gonna run into is E1. I'm gonna go from the negative to the positive. So Katie, is that positive or negative? That's positive. Positive, good, so I get a plus E1. Next thing I run into is R, little r. I'm gonna go across it in the same direction as the current. So Molly, is that positive or negative? Negative. Negative, good, so minus I2 times little r. Next thing I'm gonna run across into is R4 in the same direction as the current. So that one is also negative. So I get a minus I2 R4. Now I'm gonna to come to junction B. I'm gonna go through the center. So I'm gonna go across the battery from negative to positive. Uh, when I go from negative to positive, Emma, is that positive or negative? It's positive. Positive, good. So positive E2. And I'm gonna go across R2 in the same direction as the current. So that is negative, so I get a minus I3 little r, and then I go across R1 in the same direction as the current, so minus I3 R1 back to the junction, so that's all equal to zero. Okay. So these are my Kirchhoff loop rules. So from here, again, now we can plug in our numbers if we want to, so Equation one now becomes negative I1 times R3, which is equal to 30. So that's then 30. The uh, question, plus why, E2. Uh, What's that? Why did you use the sec the little r for that last one? Or the next to last one, the I3 little r? Oh, this one? Because we're told that R2 is equal to little r, which is equal to oh, okay. one. Yeah, it was told it was in the question. So let's see here. So now I get a minus I3 R2, which was equal to one. Uh, so even if you go through R2 twice, it's not redundant? Well, and that's not redundant because, so basically, let's see, how do I wanna explain this? So yes, I can go through this loop as many times as I want, as long as I'm going through it with independent loops. So this loop here is independent from this loop but I can also do this loop with this big loop if I wanted to avoid doing that. But as long as my loops are independent, they are going to share information. So this part here, so basically what Miranda is asking is this section here. So this section is shared by both of these two loops. So going through it multiple times is not redundant in this case. What would be redundant is if I use this loop, this loop, and the big loop, then I would have all since I'm using all three loops and I would have redundant information in that case. But yeah, so depending on how I'm going through all this stuff, so again, if I go through the big loop and then I go through the small loop, I would then use this section twice. So no matter how I basically go through my loops, I'm gonna be using sections multiple times, but again, it's not redundant because it's part of an independent loop. Okay, okay? thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. Okay. R1, which is then 40, good. And then two, let's rewrite our numbers on that one. So that's gonna be E1, which was 80, uh, minus I2 times one, minus I2 times uh, 20. 
uh, plus 45 minus I3 times 1. And then I get a minus I3 times R1, which was 40. And all that's equal to 0. So this is not just adding in my numbers. So again, what I have now are three independent equations. I have this equation and these two equations, which here I have three unknowns. So in this equation, I have two unknowns. This equation, I have two unknowns. And then in this equation, I have all three unknowns. So now I just have three equations, three unknowns. So again, however you want to solve these is completely up to you. Uh, one way you could do it is you could use this equation to solve for what? So notice here I have I1 and I3. Here I have I2 and I3. So I could use this equation to solve for I1 in terms of I3. Solve this equation for I2 in terms of I3. Plug those into this expression. So that way I'm replacing I1 here with I3, replacing I2 with I3. So now I have an I3 and I3 and I3. So now I have one equation which only depends on I3. That's one way you can do it. Uh, another way you can do it is if you know anything about linear algebra, um, you can do what's known as row reduced echelon form. So you set up what's called an augmented matrix. And then you use your calculator to then solve for it that way. Uh, that's one way I usually tell students to do it. Um, does everybody have one of those TI 1 millions or whatever they are these days? TI 85s, TI 180s, TI 3000s, I don't even know. Uh, does everybody have one of those types of calculators? Yeah. I like that you called it a TI thousands or whatever that was called. <laughs> whatever they are now these days. Yeah. I, I, honestly, I've never even owned one of them, so I don't even know how to use it, but whatever, that's fine. So if you have one of those, uh, the nice thing about that is I can teach you a way that you can put it into your calculator, and then after you hit about three buttons, it'll actually solve this entire thing for you, and you never actually have to do any algebra. Um, are we doing that today? Well, I, I'll tell you how to do that. And then you'll have to watch a video online because uh, like I said, I've never owned one of these, so I've never actually done it myself, but I know it's possible. Uh, so I will refer you to one of the many YouTube videos and then, yeah, we can set it up that way. So let me teach you how to do that. So let me teach you the way you would set it up and then I'll leave you to uh, go to YouTube and learn how to do it. So what you're gonna do is look for what's known as RREF. And what this is equal to is row reduced echelon form. So basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna create what's called an augmented matrix. And they'll teach you how to do this. So basically in the first column, we're gonna write anything associated with I1. The second column is going to be I2, third column is going to be I3, and then I, or the last column is going to be the answer. Then you're going to use your calculator and do your RREF, and what's going to happen then is at the end of the day, it's going to give you another augmented matrix, but now with I1, I2, and I3, what will happen is you'll get a 1 here, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then there's going to be a number, right? So I'm going to get, let's call this A1, A2, and A3. And what this tells you is that whatever this number is, is I1. So what will happen is you'll get I1 that is equal to A1. Whatever this number is, is I2. So I'm going to get I2 that is equal to A2. And then finally, whatever this number is, is I3. So I3 then is equal to this number. Okay. So basically, this will be just a couple of clicks of your calculator, and this is going to give you something that looks like this. And the way you just read this is, again, whatever, if this is I1, whatever this number is is I1, whatever this number is is I2, and whatever this number is is I3. So how do you actually do this? So how you do this is we're going to rewrite each one of these equations in a slightly different form. So basically what I want to do is I want to get anything that's not a current on the opposite side. So the way I'm going to do that is let's look at equation number one here. So I'm going to rewrite equation number one by taking this, this, and this, adding them to this side, and then having the 45 by itself. So I'm going to rewrite this then as 45 then is equal to I1 times 30 plus I3 times 41. Okay, so I'm going to simply add these two together. 
because I got an I3 here and an I3 here, so then I can bring this guy over here. Uh, second equation, again, I'm going to bring anything that is not an I onto one side and everything that is an I on the other side. So I'm going to add the 80 and the 45 together, so that's going to give me a 125, and I'm going to add all those other terms to the other side. So I'm going to write 125 is then equal to uh, I2 times 21 plus I3 times 41. Okay. The first equation here, we're going to rewrite then as what? I1 plus I2 minus I3 is equal to zero. So again, I want to get all the I's on one side. So the way this works is basically I'm going to take each one of these equations and simply put it in here where I'm going to write down whatever the coefficient for I1 is. So here, coefficient for I1 is 1. Coefficient for I2 is 1. Coefficient for I3 is negative 1, and that's all equal to 0. So all I'm doing is I'm rewriting this here, but I'm just writing down the coefficients. So the coefficient for I1, coefficient for I2, and coefficient for I3 is equal to the answer, which is 0. Now I'm going to do the same thing with this one. I'm going to write down whatever the coefficient for I1 is, and that's 30. Coefficient for I2, well, since there's no I2 here, that means this is plus I2 times 0 which means I'm going to put a zero here. And then I get a 41 here, and then this is all equal to 45. For this one, there is no I1, so that gives me a zero. I2, I get a 21. Coefficient for I3 is 41, and that's all equal to 125. Okay. So this is what's known as my augmented matrix. So again, all I'm doing is writing down the coefficients for each one of these equations, and then whatever that's all equal to is what's going into the answer part here. From here, again, go on to YouTube. YouTube will teach you how to do row reduced echelon form on your TI one bazillions. Hit a couple buttons, and then that's gonna spit this thing out. When it spits this out, it means whatever here is I1. So again, this number is I1, this number is I2, and this number is I3. Okay. So by doing this, you know, maybe spending an hour or so trying to figure out how to do it on your calculator, watching these YouTube videos will save you at least 20 minutes worth of algebra whenever you do any of these types of questions. Okay. Everyone's okay? And that's it. So if we do that, so if I plug this in here and then I spit this out, so what we get in this case then is, so this is what my calculator would give me. So my calculator would give me the following. So it would spit out 1001001001. Zero, 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 one. And in this case, it would spit out uh, just these numbers. So here, this would be read as minus 0 0.86. And then I would get 2.58 for the second one. And then that last one would give me 1.73. So this is what my calculator would spit out after doing the broke reduced echelon form. So this just means that I1 then would be equal to negative 0 0.86. Uh, I2 then would be equal to 2.5. And then I3 would be 1.73. Throw in my amps here, because these are all amps and then these would be my answers. Now this negative sign, the negative sign just simply means that we chose the wrong direction for I1. So when I drew I1 here going in this direction, it means that actually in reality it's actually going the opposite direction, but the magnitude is the same, so it doesn't, it doesn't actually matter. Okay. Everyone's okay? So this is Kirchhoff's loop rules. So again, as long as we go through all of these steps, so again, all the different steps, again, identify the number of currents, draw each current choosing its direction, choose independent junctions, uh, choose our independent loops, uh, choose the directions, go around each loop, apply the junction rule, apply the loop rule, and then solve, life will be great every time. Okay. So as long as we're consistent with the directions at which we choose, life will be great. Okay. 
So basically when we're determining the number of loop, or I'm sorry, the number of currents in it, mm -hmm. right now we're looking at whatever different, um, well, whatever different lines are like in series with each other, that's what, that's where the current differentiates. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. So if I drew, for example, let's draw a bigger monstrosity. So let's say I had something that was like this, uh, like this, and I put another leg on here. So let's say I had something like this with a bunch of batteries and things like that. So in this case, I would have, exactly. So I would have one current here, second current here, a third current here, a fourth current here, a fifth current here, and a sixth current here. So this would actually have six currents. Okay. Then in this case, I also have one junction here, two junctions here, three junctions here, four junctions here. So I have four junctions, okay? So right now we have six different currents. So we have six currents and we have four junctions. And then I have what, how many loops? So I have one big loop around the outside. I have two loops, three loops, four loops, five loops, six loops. I think I got all loops. So then I have six loops. Okay. So in this case, since I have six currents, I need six equations to be able to solve for all those in this case. So here, I can then choose different multiples of how many junctions I want to look at, how many loops I want to look at. So for example, here we could do three junctions. And we could do three loops, because then that would give us three and three, which is six equations. So if I wanted to do that. So here I could use this one as loop one, loop two, and loop three, and then I could choose any three of these. So I could do this junction, this junction, and say this junction. Okay. <clears throat> so that's one way I could do this, but it all depends. But you might see something like this on the homework, but there's no way I would do this to you on the exam. So don't, don't worry about that. That would just be way too much. Um, when you determine the junctions, that was just the N minus one. Right. So in this case, I had four junctions, so I had n minus one junctions. That's right. But in the loops, you went down to three. Well, I went down to three because even though I have more independent loops than that, but because I have six currents, I only need then if I use three junctions, then I only need three loops to be able to fully describe my system. Remember, mathematically, if you have you know two unknowns, then you need two equations. Three unknowns, you need three equations. Four unknowns, you need four equations, and etc. So here, I'm sorry. So here, since I have six currents and I chose to go with n minus one number of junctions, then I'm using only three loops to fully specify the entire system. Even though I have five independent loops, but I don't need all five independent loops to be able to describe the entire system. Or I could have chose two junctions and four loops, and that would be able to describe as well. Okay. Or I could choose one junction and five loops, and that would work as well. Okay. So the point is, so even though here I have n minus one number of independent junctions and minus one independent number of loops, I don't always need all of those to describe my entire system. As long as I have the number of junctions plus the number of loops equal that to the number of independent currents, which in this case is six, then I can stop there and then just use that number. But if I wanted to, I could use all three loops and all five, or sorry, all three junctions and five loops. I could do it that way as well, but now I have more equations than I actually need to be able to solve it. So even though in this case there are five independent loops, I just don't need all five independent if I use three of these junctions. Is that okay? I know it sounds a little weird in this case, but 
<laughs> but it's okay. But again, mathematically, that's just the way it, it, it works. So I only need a number of independent equations that equals my number of independent unknowns. So in this case, since I have six number of six unknowns, then I can use any combination of these that would give me six. Unless there were other things I didn't know as well. So for example, if I also didn't know one or two of the battery values or one or two of the resistor values. So in that case, I could use, I could add more unknowns, anything that would equal then in this case, since I have what, uh, 10, so three and five, so eight. So as long as I have eight unknowns within inside of my system, then I could do all the maximum value of things. But again, that's in a theoretical case. So as far as the exam is concerned, again, we're only gonna be looking at things like this, which are, in this case, three loops. We're gonna use two of them, and then two junctions, we're gonna use one of them. So as far as the exam is concerned. But again, you might see something bigger than that on the homework, but, but yeah. Okay, that's a lot of information. <laughs> Sorry about that. Is everybody doing okay? Hopefully. So uh, we don't have enough time, but tomorrow then we'll start off with a couple of uh, group assignments. So I got a couple of group assignments for you that all depend on Kirchhoff's loop rules. Uh, and then after that, we'll talk about some RC circuits, which is what happens when we combine capacitors and resistors together. And then that'll finish up all this chapter. More emails. Everyone's okay? So good. Uh, any other questions? Is doing okay. Hopefully, I didn't scare everybody too much. So, <laughs> like, we'll be great. So, like I said, Kirchhoff's loop rules is it's pretty simple once you get used to the way that we do it. So, again, just make sure you make all of your choices, you stick consistent with your choices. As long as you do those, you'll be fine going through the system. Okay. The hardest part typically is going to be the algebra, but if you learn how to do that row reduced echelon form in your calculator, that'll become much simpler. So, that's now just a couple couple of entries into your calculator and then that's pretty much about it. Okay, so it's not too difficult. Now, again, inside of Kirchhoff's loop rules is that series combination and those parallel combinations is already embedded inside of Kirchhoff's loop rules. So you don't have to do that at all. So even out here where we had, um, you know, things that were in series with each other, like R1 was in series with R2, we didn't have to specifically combine those down together to create one equivalent capacitor, which was R1, R2. We didn't have to do that. That's already embedded inside of Kirchhoff's loop rules. So everything that we learned previous to this is already inside of Kirchhoff's loop rules. We don't have to do that independently. It'll automatically be done for us inside of Kirchhoff's loop rules. Okay. So it's a lot more general, it's a lot easier way to actually do it. It'll work in those other cases as well, but again, wherever you have independent things going on, you have independent currents, so it can get a little ugly. So in those cases, you're actually better off combining everything in parallel and resistance, like as in the uh, extra credit assignment. So there it's actually easier to combine things in parallel and series first until you get two loops, then use Kirchhoff's loop rules determine the currents, and then unravel what you did before that to then determine all those independent, independent currents. Okay. So anyways, I'll stop talking. <laughs> so if there's no more questions, then uh, I guess we'll break for now, and then we will meet up in about 15 minutes for the lab. Okay. Everybody's doing okay?